This is the introductory video for the Physics 1101-1120 Resonance of an Air Column Practice Lab. So the point of this experiment is we want to measure the speed of sound in air. To do that, we're going to need a column of air. So that's what this tube here is, is it's our column of air. However, we want to adjust the length of that column, and how are we going to do that? Well, this tube is connected at the bottom with a rubber tube to this metal cup and we're going to fill up the cup with water, and because it's connected to the tube, that's also going to raise the water level inside the tube. So then our air column is just going to be from the top of the tube to the top of the water. So we're using the water level as the bottom of our tube. So to measure the speed of sound, we're going to need something that'll emit some sound waves. So you've been given a set of five tuning forks, and to get one of these guys ringing, you take the rubber mallet and you just hit it on the side, like this, which you won't be able to hear because it's not next to my microphone. Don't hit these on the desk or other hard surfaces, please. Just only use the rubber mallet because they can be damaged. So what we'll be doing is we'll strike this to set it ringing, and then we'll put it over top of our column of air. What that does is that the tuning fork sends sound waves down the tube, they reflect off the surface of the water, and they come back up. So we've got two sets of sound waves, one going down the tube, one coming up the tube. For most lengths of the air column, those two waves, the one going down and the one coming up, are going to interfere with each other destructively, so we won't hear anything special. However, for certain lengths of the column of air, the two sound waves will actually interfere constructively. That means that the high pressure and low pressure regions of the sound waves are in the same locations, physically, in this tube. When that happens, we're going to hear the sound get louder. So that's how we're going to locate the resonance frequencies for this column of air, is we're going to use this cup and the water level, and we'll be adjusting the water level, up or down, with the tuning fork over top of the tube, and when we hear the sound get loud, that's when we know we found the right length to get a resonance pattern. Now we could adjust the water level down and down and down, and find a whole bunch of different resonances for the same tuning fork, but that's not actually what we're going to do in this experiment. You're just going to find the first resonance, but you're going to do it for all five of your tuning forks. And then we're going to make a graph of that data. So now let me move this apparatus forward so you can see it a little better, and then I'll explain how you take data. So to begin with, you want to measure the diameter of your tube, and that'll be the inner diameter, so just measure it directly with a ruler. Next, we're going to want to fill up our reservoir with water. Now, you want this to be at the highest position possible when you do this, just because that'll give us the most flexibility in setting the height of the water in the tube. So you get it to the highest possible setting, and then you can start filling it up with water. And this will just take a moment for you to see the water level coming up. And now I've got the water pretty much at the top of the tube. And by the way, it's possible that as you're watching the water level come up, you might suddenly realize you've put too much water in and it's going to overflow and spill everywhere. If you're scared that's going to happen, that disaster is about to befall you, pinch here. So that stops water from going from the cup into the tube, and that will stop the water level from rising. And then you've got two things you can do. You can either pull the cup out and empty it out, or you can lower the cup. Because as soon as you lower the cup, you'll notice that the water level will start dropping. That's because the two water levels are going to equalize. So as I said, if you see this about to spill over, pinch the tube as your emergency measure, and then either empty out the cup a little bit, or lower the cup in order to drop the water level in your tube. This also demonstrates how we're going to adjust the length of the air column in our experiment, is we're going to pinch the rubber tube, lower the cup, then we'll set our tuning fork ringing right over top of the air column, and unpinch the rubber hose in order to drop the water level, and then we'll just listen for that resonance. When you find it, you should pinch to stop the water level dropping any farther, and then there's a scale directly on the tube to help you measure how long the column of air is. However, you may need to go up and down a few times through the resonance in order to get the most accurate value. I'm going to demonstrate this now using the 1000 Hz tuning fork. However, I'm going to have to put my microphone right beside the column of air so that you can hear the resonance, so that means I won't be able to talk to you while I'm doing this. I will tell you, though, that I know that the first resonance for this tuning fork should be happening at about 8 centimeters.
So hopefully you were able to hear that. When the tuning fork was ringing over the column of air and the water level dropped between about 8 and 10 centimeters, the sound suddenly intensified. And that's the first resonance, and the length of air column that gave you that resonance is what you need to find. You may need to go up or down a couple of times in order to get an accurate value. You're going to find that length for the first resonance for all five of your tuning forks. The range of values that you're likely to see will run from about 3 centimeters to about 40 centimeters. So for each tuning fork, you go and find that length of air column that gives you the first resonance. The uncertainties on the frequencies of the tuning forks is given in the apparatus section of your lab manual. The uncertainties on these length measurements will obviously have some reading uncertainty, but quite a significant amount of physical uncertainty just due to the method that we're using to get this length. So think carefully about what you think your uncertainty on these length measurements should be and explain that rationale well to your lab instructor in your lab notebook. And finally, one last thing you'll need to measure is the temperature in the room. The reason why is we're going to be graphing our data from this apparatus in order to find the speed of sound, but we're also going to compare that value to a theoretical value. So in the lab manual, there is a formula that allows you to calculate the speed of sound based on the temperature in the room, and you're going to compare that to the value that you get off your graph from this data. Now in the next part of the video, I'm going to talk about how you get the speed of sound from that graph. If you look at the theory section of the lab manual, they go through some derivations that show you that the relationship between the length of the air column and the frequency of the tuning fork can be written like this. So we're going to graphically verify this theory. What it means to graphically verify something is we are literally going to graph our data and then check whether the shape of our graph and the values given by the graph agree with what this theory, this equation, predicted. Now we're going to make a linear graph of this and at first glance that might seem a little odd because this is not a linear relationship. Length is proportional to 1 over the frequency. So if we just graphed length versus frequency, we'd get a graph that looks like this. So we'd get an inverse shape like this, and then how would we extract our speed of sound from this graph? Well, we're not going to try to. We're going to do something called linearizing the data. So let's compare our equation to y equals mx plus b, the equation for a straight line on a graph. We notice that if we graph length on the y-axis and 1 over f on the x-axis rather than just f, then that should give us a straight line graph, where the slope is equal to the speed of sound over 4, and the y-intercept is equal to this dc correction factor that is mentioned in the theory section. So the speed of sound, v, is what we're looking to get out of our graph. So next we have to actually graph our data, and we would do it as follows. We would create a graph with length on the y-axis and 1 over frequency on the x-axis. We'd plot our five data points on this, and then we'd fit a straight line through them. According to the theory, the slope of this line will be equal to the speed of sound divided by 4, and the y-intercept of the line will be equal to this dc term. In other words, we'd calculate the slope of this, an actual numerical value, and then set that equal to v divided by 4 and solve for v. So there's a little bit of math to get your speed of sound from the slope.